morning adventure. It's good to see you guys, all your smiling faces, some of your smiling faces. So uh, if you're new with us, I uh, want to make sure you get one of these worship folders. Uh, we've got lots of them over there where those lights are hanging down, so make sure you grab one of those. Um, it's a little different, and I kind of put a little bit of an explanation on the, uh, the front of the listening guide to kind of give you an idea of, of why this is different. Obviously, uh, our teaching style is just a little bit different, so the listening guide reflects that a bit. We'll talk more about that uh, as we get to the lesson time. Uh, the other thing that should be in there is an uh, announcement sheet. Uh, the big thing that I just want to uh, focus you in on is a spiritual gifts class. That's coming up on October 8th, 15th, and 22nd. So that's not one of those three. It's uh, spiritual gifts is all three of those classes or all three of those days. Um, that's a great class, man. That's if you're trying to figure out maybe what God's wired you towards or what your next steps are or uh, what your purpose is, I can't tell you that, but um, that class is designed to maybe help you discover that as we, uh, we sort through those things. So, uh, and I'd just say, too, if you've been through it in the past and you haven't been through it in a while, maybe it's time to uh, go back through because God's always getting us ready for those next things. So... Um, if you're new with us, we'd also ask you, there should be a, uh, a card on the table. It's an information card. If you want to fill that out for us at the end of the service, you can take it over again where those lights are hanging down, and uh, we've got a gift for you. So with all that said, let's take a minute, let's pray, and we'll get into worship here. Father, we love you, and we thank you for today. We thank you for the rain last night. Um, we thank you for the, the way that you, uh, you take care of the world and the way that you make things grow, and we just simply pray that you help us to grow as well. Um, Lord, we love you. We thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand. Let's worship. Welcome, everyone. Good morning.
seated. Hey, a couple of things for you so we get started real quick. Some of you drove by here um, Friday and you saw all the kids here. So we are the uh, evacuation center for Fillmore School. So if they have a problem, something happens and they have to clear their building, they come here. And um, so they practice once a semester. And so that was their practice. So those teachers, five, a group of 550, walked through the neighborhood and across the field uh, here so the kids could practice. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was fun. Yeah, it was a blast. Uh, giving high fives in the doorway. Yeah. And Greg Ashby, Greg was here. Greg went to school there. And so all these little kids were pointing at Greg going, this guy used to go to your school back when dinosaurs still walked <laughs> the earth. So that was fun. And then uh, 
uh, Friday night for the Kids Against Hunger. Adventure Lane did the Kids Against Hunger thing here, and they prepared 3,000 meals. Yeah. So they did a good job. Yeah, so we're pretty excited about that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so obviously, uh, if you weren't here last week, this is a little bit different than what we normally do. Uh, again, your listening guide uh, reflects that a little bit. You know, think about the listening guide as kind of a more of a companion guide, I think, maybe at this point. Um, as we're going through some of these fundamental things, kind of foundational things to what it means to be a believer, um, as we talked, we just thought, you know what, this would be more fun to do and maybe more interesting and maybe more applicable as well as a conversation rather than kind of a normal teaching scenario. And so that's what we're doing. It's a little different. It's an experiment for us. Uh, we're learning some things too. But if you get lost in the listening guide, we're, we're, we, we're, we put the questions in there that are guiding our conversation. But uh, there's no blanks. So don't anybody have any anxiety. If you kind of, if you look down, you're like, I'm not sure where they are. It's fine. All the blanks are filled in for Just you. Look it's for gonna familiar be easy. words. Yes, it will be fine. So um, this week we're talking. I, yeah, I was talking to you about my grandparents earlier this week, and they've they've kind of been they've been a major prayer request for us for a couple of years. Um, my grandfather. So my grandpa's 95. My grandma's 90. They still live on their own. Uh, we moved them from Georgia to, to southern back to southern Indiana a couple of years ago, which was a hard move. And uh, that's where they wanted to be. And so my grandfather has, man, he's my hero. And he's always been my hero. Um, and so he has, on top of other health stuff, which he's got some, some major pain with uh, spinal stenosis and some other things. But he's over 60. Yeah. He, um, he has dementia, and it's gotten really, it's, it's really progressed over the last couple of years. That's just so hard to watch. Mm. Um, hard to watch grandma trying to take care of him and try to deal with that. I know some of you guys have, have worked through some of that stuff as well. And uh, I, I called, I actually video chatted with them. We got them one of those Amazon things where they all they have to do is like hit the button when we call them. That works great, by the way. Those are awesome. Um, and so I, we could video chat with them. And so I, I was video chatting with them, and uh, grandpa really wasn't even present in the conversation. And so that was kind of one aspect of what was going on. Um, and I got permission to tell this story. Uh, I actually asked my grandma if I could. But um, so I was talking to grandma. She was, they'd had some really rough nights, and she was about in tears, and um, she was in tears. And uh, she said, you know, Travis, she goes, I, I know God loves us. I know, you know, God has a plan. She goes, but I just don't understand. And she goes, I, I'm, I'm praying for him to go peacefully and just, you know, this is not life. And um, I don't understand. She goes, I don't know what's here for him, and I don't understand why he's leaving him here. And, you know, so why doesn't he just take him? This is a tough woman. Yeah, she is. This is this is a tough woman. Yeah, she. she so she grew up. Um, she grew up in a in a Philippine concentration camp. So the entire occupation of the Philippine Islands. She and by the her, Japanese. That's the war we're talking about. Yeah. So she came out. Right. I think when she was twelve. So she had seven. Well, there were seven of them total. Six brothers and sisters. They they grew up in the concentration camp. Great grandma was really tough. Tell you what, that lady was really tough. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that's grandma. And I mean, grandma, she takes care of things. She's kind of no nonsense. But yeah, you know, she's just at that point. And and there was almost a little bit of, oh, I don't know. I there was a little bit of almost shame in her saying that because she's like, I know I'm supposed to trust God. I know I love God. And you know, they are faithful. Man, they are the two most faithful people I've ever met in my Great entire people. life. Great people. Um, so it's, it wasn't a question of that, but there was almost shame that was there in the midst of it. And, you know, I get it. It's, it's hard because she's torn with this thing that everybody struggles with at some point in their life, some, probably multiple times throughout their life. And it's this promise in Scripture that God is good and that he's loving. And then trying to reconcile that with all the brokenness that we're surrounded by and that we experience. And, and it left me in a little bit of a weird space, too, because, you know, I... I know what the answer is supposed to be. She knows what the Sunday school, VBS, Jesus. church, you know, yes. right answer is. Let's be honest. When life gets hard, I mean, it gets messy. And, and it's, it's hard sometimes to reconcile our, 
ourselves with something that we know is the truth. And, you know, I, I know you and I have met so many people who have struggled through similar things, a lot who've walked away from the church, walked right. away from relationship with God over this, these unresolved dilemmas. Right. And, and, you know, that, that's one side of this. On the other side of it is this struggle that I, I've seen within the church to deal with hard questions. It's part of what this whole series is about. Um, and a lot of Christians and pastors and churches who, who have looked at somebody like my grandma and said, you know, you just need to have faith. Man, I, I tell you what, if you go to somebody and just tell them, hey, you're not being healed because you don't have enough faith, you know, yeah, we, you need to just be happy even though wow. you're watching your, your 95-year-old husband suffer because you should have more faith, I, I'll throat punch you. Yeah, Straight absolutely. Up. We will um, beat you to death. We had a gal in our church in uh, Missouri who, uh, just tell you, this will date it for some of you. She had a lot of back pain and they couldn't figure out what was going on, so they did exploratory surgery. Remember that term, some of you? The rest of you, Google it up or watch the History Channel. And uh, so they did exploratory surgery on her and found after they opened her up, she was chock full mm. of cancer, like stage four maxed out. Uh, she would die about two to three weeks later. But after they found out what was wrong with her, her brother, who was a pastor, drove from Indiana all the way to the far side of Missouri to tell her if she just had faith, she wouldn't die. Ooh. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't we do will that. beat you. Yeah, yeah you may don't die. Do that. You, um, might, you might beat your loved one at that you point. Know, and, and so, but there's this thing, and I don't think we know how to use this idea of faith. You know, and I've, because I've, I've heard phrases like that spoken out of desperation, you know, because we don't know what to say. We're like, you know, you just need to have faith. Um, you know, I've, I've heard it used as a club you know, that, that Christians wield against people and it caused all kinds of hurt and confusion and shame. And, and I've heard it, as it used as a callow res, callous response from a lot of really shallow believers. Um, and it gets used in so many different words. That word faith gets used in so many ways. And I think if you ask most Christians what's a definition of faith, there's kind of this churchy answer, which is Hebrews 11.1, uh, which says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. And it seems like a definition of faith. Um, I think it'd be worth having a conversation about what faith actually is and why does it seem right. to be so misunderstood and how can it help us when we find ourselves asking hard questions like my grandma. So what, when we, we read a scripture like that, and Hebrews 11 one is the one everybody goes back to, what does scripture mean when it talks about faith? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a great verse. It's a good go-to yeah. verse. The problem is we don't, as we're kind of, why we're talking about this today is we don't have a really a good understanding of what faith is. So the idea of faith, the, the word that the writer of Hebrews uses is actually a secular word. It's a secular Greek word. It's yeah. the word pistis. It looks like P-S-T-I-S, -S, pistis. Um, but it's pronounced pistis. And it was a word that would be used like a legal term. And it would be today, we would say that an attorney, uh, an attorney has uh, three things he's going to do when he presents to a jury. A, an attorney's going to explain what he's going to present or she, what they're going to present, uh, and why it's believable. They try to set the, the uh, get a frame of mind for the people listening to the evidence to understand this is evidence. Then they're going to present the evidence as convincingly as they can. That's the second part. And then the third part is they're going to come back and then they're going to summarize all of it and show how this is the only outcome. This is the factual stuff. This is the only outcome. And so it's actually evidence-based. Hmm. And so you have to have evidence. And you see the evidence and the evidence is where faith comes from. So Christians took that term, pistis, faith, and brought it into what we would call the religious realm or into our relationship with the Lord. And the idea behind it is that our relationship with the Lord is actually evidence-based. We see what God has done through history. And so when the writer of Hebrews, who is writing to, guess who? Hebrews. Jewish people. He's writing to Jewish people. And so as he's making this case and he's telling them, these are people who are being put to death at that time. They're being put to death for their faith in Christ, and they're starting to wobble. They're starting to get uh, become very afraid of what's going on around them. And so he's telling them, no, no, go back to your focus. 
Look at the evidence in your life. And so Hebrews 11, he basically comes along and he says, well, starting in verse 3, he says, by faith, by pistis, we understand. And then he says, by faith, Abel, by faith, Enoch, by faith, Noah, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Sarah. And so he lays up and what he's saying to these people, it's really ingenious. He's reminding them, these things are not imaginary. This is not mythology. Right. This is your family history. These are your relatives that did these things. They're the ones who were found righteous because of the evidence in their life, and that's been passed down to you um, as evidence. So really what the, the writer of Hebrews is doing is he's just telling everybody faith is based on evidence. It's not, a, it's not just a wild hope. So just to be clear, you know, I, I think a lot of times we use the word faith. We use it in terms of uh, that's my religion. Yep. This is my belief system. Yep. Uh, these are my doctrines. Um, and then there's this other level. And really, it, in a lot of ways, you could just about go through Scripture and everywhere that you see the word faith, you could actually translate it as the word trust, and it would probably be biblically accurate. Yeah, be pretty close. Because it's, it's about this, there's a promise there's trust, and then that next step, and that's really what the, the writer of Hebrews is getting at, is, okay, when you have a promise and you trust in that promise, it's going to lead to actual action in some way, right. shape, or form, right? Because right. truth leads, Correct. To, truth leads to, to, to action. It, it forces. So we talked last week about belief, and again, I, I think there's this confusion. You know, again, so many words. The Greeks had like three ways of saying, you know, love. They had multiple expressions for love. We have, I love steak. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my dog. I love my new lawn that actually has real grass. I, I you know, we use love in so many different ways. The faith's kind of the same thing where we, we've turned it into this big common phrase, but they had really specific things that this meant. Um, so what's the difference between belief and faith? So this is a big argument. Yeah, this is a big argument. This is a big, big, big struggle people have. So belief and faith are inseparable. You can't have one without the other. If you don't believe, you're not going to have faith. And if you don't have faith, you also don't believe because they're based. They're, they're, that's the sequence. Belief is this internal thing. And then the faith is kind of the leaking out mm. of that belief into my actions, into my life, into how I process information. So belief is the starting point, but faith is actually the maturing of belief. Faith is where belief uh, hits the road. But again, it's based on evidence. It's based on what God, what we know God has done through scripture or what we've seen him do through our lives. And that's, that's kind of the big difference. So when we talk about belief, we're kind of Again, we're getting back to this kind of promise it's idea. It's real easy to throw the words back and forth. It and is. They shouldn't be thrown back and forth. Right. Um, and, and I'll just tell you, too, there's, there's arguments among theologians and philosophers. And, I mean, they'll, they'll parse through. It's important for us to have a conversation, though, where we kind of we make some delineations in these things. So you got promise. And, again, it goes to trust then, which is really the faith aspect, which that makes sense with the Hebrews 11.6 then, right? Without faith, it's impossible to please right. God. Because um, anybody who, who comes to him has to trust, uh, must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So, uh, and James talks about faith leading to action. So right. belief is about kind of coming to an understanding of. Faith is going based on this understanding of, now here's what I'm going to do in life. Is that fair? Yeah, Let's sure. Really yeah. Be clear on it. So, well, so with that said, what does that actually do then? What, what does faith do for us? What is it supposed to do in life? Well, you, you've got to grow in faith. I mean, again, faith is the maturing of belief. And faith ought to cause us to challenge in our life what isn't proper mm. in a believer's life. Um, I'm kind of of the opinion of that which doesn't challenge me doesn't change me. And so my faith has got to be challenging me. It's got to be helping me move in a direction because I, I, I don't just look for the evidence of what God has done, but I also look at the evidence of what I've done. And I look at the evidence as if there's any change with me. And what faith ultimately does as it matures, well, Paul says in Galatians, he, he lists the, the, the fruit of the Spirit. Hmm. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so those are things that are going to show that my belief 
is actually maturing because those are challenges that are going to change my life. Yeah, so that makes sense in like 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we, we live by faith, not by sight. Right. So I have this, this promise that I, I trust because I trust, and sometimes I think we, we read that and we read it in this big ethereal way. Um, With the Charlton Heston voice. Yeah, uh, but I mean, not by sight is also oh. just by, hey, this doesn't make sense to what's in front of me right now, but Grandma. Right, there you I go. don't understand. Right. I, I, don't, I don't see why would God leave him here. I don't see the purpose. I can't see that right now. Um, and that's where you have to go back to that, that trust that, I, okay, I know God is a loving God. There's evidence of that in my life. There's evidence of that in Scripture. So even though I don't see it right now, I'm going to trust that that is still true. And so that leads us to a different outcome, right? Right. Um, again, it, that becomes then the basis for really all of following Christ. Yeah, sure. So we look at that. We just we chase down the evidence. We see from Scripture. We see from history what he's done, and that determines where we go next. Yeah. Um, okay, so that common use of the word faith then, how does that potentially mislead us? And the way even just we oh, use man. it in the church. Yeah, a lot. I mean, it, it messes us up big time. Um, so the original concept from Hebrews of faith, the writer of Hebrews took a secular term and then it, it shaped Christianity. And it has shaped us, especially in the English-speaking world, through all of that uh, into the present. You know, I want to go way back in history. Remember when uh, the serpent came to Adam and Eve in the garden? Remember what he said that deceived them? Remember how he got them? He said, did God really say you can't eat from any fruit in the garden? You can't eat from any of the trees in the garden? Remember that? What's he doing? He's playing a word game. He's taking something and twisting it just a little bit, just skewing it just a little bit. And rather than refute it, they chased it. They went down that path with him. And I'll tell you, the word faith, Satan has taken that from the, the sense that we're reading it today and has warped it over the years, has gotten people to change and redefine it. It's kind of been hijacked. Uh, the hijacking in the English really started during the Enlightenment period. Yeah. Um, so last week you talked about Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson, yeah. Jefferson took his Bible and took a razor blade to it and cut out every miracle mentioned in the Gospels. Just literally cut it out so that he didn't have anything in there. He considered those things mythological. And by the way, that's when it became the good book was at that time because there was some good stuff in it. Yeah. Uh, and that was that little twisting that happened. And... Um, the Enlightenment period, when that happened, was a time when people were saying, we don't need God to explain things. We can explain things through science. So they right. ignore the fact that all of the early scientists were Christians. And they saw science as a way to explain God's hand, to see what God was doing. They wanted to understand God more and more. But unfortunately, people started saying, well, if it isn't science, it's religion. If it's religion, it's superstition. Or, it, or, or it's a myth. And unfortunately, a lot of pastors in the Enlightenment period and a lot of theologians in the Enlightenment period started buying into that. And they started saying things that were just stupid and honestly were contradictory to the evidence in Scripture. And so it began a downward slide. So they made up phrases like this. Faith is just a leap, of, uh, a leap into the dark. Nowhere does Scripture say you leap into the dark. It always says, look what God has done. Um, or you'll see people say, well, faith isn't one of those things that ever requires any evidence. You know, you just have faith that it's true. You don't need evidence. You just have faith that it's well, true. It, and it almost became celebrated in the church. Yeah. Like, hey, we have this thing nobody else has. Look how cool we are. Yeah. There was a phrase that was popularized, I believe because it is absurd. Oh, which yeah. uh, there was one author I was reading. He yeah. said that was Christianity's first meme. Yeah. Um, was was that uh, that goes actually it goes all the way back to Tertullian, but that got really really popular yeah. in that Enlightenment period, and I think since because we're like oh you know there and we take right. stuff outward right where in the New Testament it talks about hey without the Holy Spirit you can't understand some of this stuff and so we don't look at things the same way they do and so it became this partisan us yeah. versus them well, thing of we've got something they don't and it's blind trust yeah and that's not biblical. No. I mean, that's suicidal. That's not biblical. 
It's at least foolish. <laughs> yeah. So they started taking the word faith and they trickled it out and they expanded it to anything anybody wanted to believe. And so all religions became known as faiths, even when there was no evidence for that faith. Um, I don't know if you knew this or not, but did you know you can legally become a Jedi today? It's a recognized religion in the U.S., Jediism. And you can go out and do your little dance with your lightsaber and all that stuff. Believe me, I'm a Star Wars fan. I just watched one of the movies last night, waiting on my wife to get home. Did you see the, the one I sent you on Instagram last night? Yes. With Darth Vader killing ducks with the Force? Yes. It was an amazing painting somebody I did. I would have loved to have taken it. Let me know, and I'll, I'll send it to you. It was actually really cool. Yeah, so <laughs> now you can legally become a Church of the Jedi with no evidence of Jediism. It didn't exist before 19, 1977. So you see this stuff largely was triggered in earnest in the United States. Flag Day 1954, Dwight, Dwight Eisenhower, President Eisenhower gives a speech and he makes a statement that sounds good until you realize what he's done with it. He said, our government makes no sense unless it is founded on a deeply felt religious faith. Which that's where people pause. That's where people stop, but that's not what he said. He went on and he said, and I don't care what it is. So we have watched the devaluation of the concept of faith away from evidence, a, an evidence-driven uh, belief in God to just whatever you want to believe with, even without evidence. Well, it just becomes this felt religious thing. Right. Right, and that's where religion just became kind of a, a bystanding thing. So I, I want to go back just real quick. Yeah, go um, for it. So that causes actual problems, though, in our life. Yeah, you know time. when we when we use that word, and there's in the church specifically. I'm just going to talk about with Christ followers for a minute. So I think there's a couple of things that can do. One, um, we get to this point where we think if we just have the right beliefs, it'll save us. Because again, faith is just doctrine. If I say the right. right things about what I believe. You're right. Yeah. If I just, if I hold to, so if I admit there's a, there's a guy upstairs. I heard that one yeah. earlier this week. There's a, there's a man upstairs. So if I, I do that, but that's where James is talking about. And he goes, look, what good is it to have that kind of faith? Right. Yeah. Um, it can lead us to, I think, legalism, which is what Jesus dealt with a lot right. as he's sorting through. I mean, Sermon on the Mount. Hey, so, you heard this. So what's legalism? Do you find legalism? Yeah. Legalism is, is going through and taking those sets of beliefs and, and it doesn't become belief at that point. Right. It just simply becomes criteria that you follow rigidly. The problem with that is if you don't actually sort through that criteria, at some point it breaks down. Right. Um, and so it can't be so rigidly held to. There's probably a better way of, of, of describing it. So you got a better definition. I'm all, I'm all ears uh, part, on it. Part of legalism says, uh, here's the checklist I see from Scripture. Yeah. And so I'm going to do that, but just to make sure that it gets right, I'm going to enforce it just a little bit tighter. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to force a little bit tighter, and I'm not going to. You don't have to have your heart involved in it at all. As long as you do these things, God's going to. Well, let and you if in. you don't have my checklist, yes. then you are not. You're you a can't heretic. be. Yeah, you can't You're be part of this thing. Right. Um, the and, and that's where Jesus talk, at one point he says these people honor me with their lips. Right. You know, but their hearts are far from me. So it's easy for us to get to a point where we follow God without following God. Right. Okay, I want to go back though. So Mark 11, 22 through 25, there's that moment where Jesus says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can right. tell a mountain to throw itself into the sea. And I've seen that so abused in the church. Right. What's the issue there? Well, he's using, he's using a metaphor or an analogy. I forget the wording on it. It's one or the other. Um, and what he's talking about, he's not saying you can say to this, like he's not saying you can say to this building out back, because the way we use go faith, to a different neighborhood. The way we use go. faith in the church is if you just believe hard enough, right. then God will do what you want Him to do. Right, and that's not the case. Uh, he's saying basically it's a spiritual metaphor, and he's saying when you come up against a spiritual mountain, if you have your faith in the Lord, you can say to this spiritual metaphor that's out there, Jesus has got this. I'm going with Him on this. 
and you get out of my way because I'm following Christ, he says, then God will take that and he'll get you through that. He's not talking about a physical mountain somewhere. I mean, that was the illustration. That was the verbal or the visual illustration. But he's talking about spiritual things. He's talking about philosophical things. He's talking about personal struggles. Um, and people misunderstood it. Can you imagine? I don't think they misunderstood it then. I think they misunderstood it after that. Can you imagine what the world would look like if we really had the ability to pull that off? Because I was a kid once. I grew up in Kentucky with hills all over the place. I'd have been throwing trees around, destroying things. Um, I had a lot of faith. Well, you'd be able to ski in Iowa. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> Iowans would put a mountain somewhere. Right. So I, we've already kind of hit on this, I think. But just to reiterate, um, can faith ever be dangerous? You know, does it lead us to harm? Is it something that is actually something that can be not good for yes. us? Biblical faith is always good for you. It's the adding to stuff. It's the uh, misuse of the concept of faith that gets you in trouble. I mean, you think about these, think about these cults that talk about faith, and they have a Christian basis. Remember the uh, Heaven's Gate cult in San Diego that said the mothership was coming, and they all had to drink poison just before it got there to be taken away? And they had the mass suicide. Uh, Jonestown, which actually started, oh, the same town, um, actually started in San Diego, too. <laughs> now, that's interesting. Uh, I might have there's to a think pattern. about San All Diego. Right. Okay. Um, but uh, they killed themselves. Uh, you look at, like, uh, the Branch Davidians in Waco. Remember those guys? That was actually a Seventh-day Adventist cult. Um, I've been studying this week. I had an officer, um, and I'll go and have killed this week. And so I've been kind of going back and reviewing some of these officer-involved shootings. The biggest one that changed everything was the no nor uh, excuse me, North Coast Battle, 1980. Yeah. And, there, and you've probably seen the video of it. A bunch of cops take, trying to take on four or five young men who were armored up and carrying, carrying big-style weapons and everything. Those boys ended up destroying 32 police cars and one helicopter before it was over. It was Grand Theft Auto. For it was real. it was Grand Theft Auto in real life. Probably the basis for the game. Don't play that game. Yeah, don't yeah don't do that. It's a bad game. And don't act it out. Um, <laughs> but what most people don't realize is that was a Bible study that did that. That was a Bible study. The oldest guy in the Bible study was a bit of a doomsdayer, and his thing was Jesus is coming back. It's all ours. Let's go take it. So. The thing with these people who lead people astray is they don't stay with God's word. They don't look at it as evidence. They add to it. They, they add to it. They go outside of God's word. They explain it away. That allows them to be deceived. And you can usually spot them because they do the, consistently do the same things. They change Jesus. They make a different Jesus in there. Uh, they make a different Jesus they have a different way of salvation, usually based on all the things you do. So you have to earn your salvation through works. Um, they have a, 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 an inconsistent view of the Bible. They'll take this verse, but not that verse. They'll say the Bible's accurate here, the Bible's inaccurate here. Or they interpret the Bible toward one direction all the time. And so ultimately, they teach this works salvation. They teach that faith is all this stuff that you do. They teach... Uh, that you don't need to study the Word of God for yourself, that they'll tell you what you need to know. And when people aren't studying the Word of God themselves, they get brainwashed. Yeah. They get dragged away. Well, and, and I will say that it's not always nefarious either. No, no. Sometimes it, it, it can also just creep over time. You know, it, it's a lot of what Jesus was dealing with. Again, going back to the Sermon on the Mount, when he's like, look, I know. So you heard this. You heard oh, it yeah, said right. this. I'm telling you, you guys got it off. Let me tell you what it actually meant. And, you know, at one point, Jesus actually looks at some people and he says, why do you by your traditions violate direct commandments of God? Well, how do you get to that point? Well, um, over time it creeps and rabbi so-and-so teaches this. And then instead of going back to scripture, the next rabbi teaches off that rabbi. And then the rabbi after that goes back to that rabbi. And so you get what, 10, 12 generations Big, out yeah, and right. suddenly Big gap. nobody's going back to the source document. Well, it's easy to, to get headed right. in a totally different direction, which by the way, that's not just picking on ancient Judaism or Judaism no. today. I, that, that is true in a lot of churches, I've a got, lot of different churches I have a couple today. friends who are denominational pastors, 
And uh, I have been in their offices where I see their Bible is this thick, and then I see the denominational handbook is this thick. That ought to be your first sign something's wrong with this picture. And, and it's not just denominations no, either. No, no, it's it, not. I mean, one, one of the first things they do in Bible college, um, your, one of your first sets of classes is just an introduction to Old Testament and New right. Testament. And the reason why they do it that way is because a lot of, my, my grandma Rame, I love her, man, she was one of the greatest ladies who ever lived. She taught Sunday school her whole life. But there were some things that when I got to Bible college, I realized Grandma Rame had told me that weren't quite the way that she had <laughs> made it out to be in Scripture. Well-meaning, loving, you know, I mean, just loved God, but it was a bit simplistic, or maybe it was just totally off. And so, you know, that can happen. And so Scripture says to test ourselves, um, which that comes back then, okay, how do we then make sure our faith is actually grounded because I think that's the key. It's not just, it's not just this this blind trust. Right. It's got to be grounded trust. Well, again, that which doesn't challenge me doesn't change me. Yeah, that's, that's the first thing. That's a thing. good criteria. And you've got to be involved in a Bible study. You need to be with godly people in Bible study. You need to be in your own Bible study. You need to have a prayer time. There's just no other way around it. If you don't do those things, you are susceptible to brainwashing. And, and being pulled off the path. That's, that's how you learn what to believe about God and how what you're believing about God is the truth about God. That's why Scripture says, well, Paul tells Timothy, all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the perfect man of God may be adequate. That's not talking about pastors. That's talking man was a mm. universal term. This idea yeah. of men being called one thing and women being called something else is actually pretty new in history. Um, it's talking about man, which meant everyone would be equipped for every good work. And that's the, it's, he's just telling you, you've got to be in Scripture. And I, and I just say, we work hard at doing that. You know, one of the reasons right. why our listening guides a lot of times have extra scripture in it that we don't, we don't reference or we don't is just so that that's there as, as source stuff that you can go back to later and, and work off that because we really value that. We believe it's really important to go back to the source document and test everything, right. including what we right. teach yeah, and we, what we yeah, say. Yeah, we want you to check up on what we say. So, I mean, here's reality. Life is hard. We're going to end up in situations that um, aren't fair, mm. um, don't feel right, that make us angry, that hurt. Um, See, reading your diary. You know, I, yeah. you know, they're going to involve our kids. They're going to involve our parents and our grandparents. They're going to involve work. They're going to they're going to involve all kinds of things. Life is hard. All of us deal m with moments like with what my grandma was dealing with. And in that moment, she was being honest, which, by the way, that, that is yep. one other thing that I, I will say. Yep. And we didn't really put this in here, but one of the things, if you read through the book of Psalms, if you read through any of the prophets, man, there are times where Job. they... Job. Job, absolutely. Where they, they go back to God and they go, this is not fair, this is not right, this is not how it's supposed to be. What are you doing? Yep. And God never chastises any of them for that. Yeah. And I think there's a reason for that. Um, wh what do I do when it's hard in a moment to believe in God's promise? I might know it, but when it's hard for me to see, how do I live by faith and not by sight sometimes? Well, I, you know, personally, I remember going back seven years ago, two weeks ago, where I uh, was in a hospital, and my surgeon said, I, prob I, I think I can fix your pain, but I don't think you're going to walk again. That made for a long series of nights in the hospital. And I'll tell you, I, I, was, I was miffed and I was angry at God. Um, but at the same time, I made a choice in the middle of that anger, in the middle of that frustration, um, I made a choice in my heart to go back to what I knew about God. And I went back to what I had learned about God in my childhood. I went back to what Scripture said about God. And I knew God was going to be good. And he was going to make this work out for the good. It doesn't, notice it doesn't say God makes everything work out for your good. 
says he makes it work out for the good. And I was okay with that based on what I knew about God that I could trust him. Can I, can I push you on that, though? Yeah, go and for it. Don't, so, because I don't want to placate. I don't, I don't want to turn this into another one of those sermons. So oh, yeah, yeah. Let's be honest, though. That didn't take away some of the depression. Heck no. And it didn't take away the anger. Nope. And it didn't take away the pain. Right. And it didn't take away... I mean, that was that was a. I remember. Yeah. I mean, that was a long year. Yeah. Um, and it was long even after that year. What it what it did. I mean, it doesn't take away what I'm feeling because the, what I'm feeling is just what I'm going to feel. You know, it's uh, like Martin Luther talked about. You know, uh, birds flying over your head. Mm. Birds are like sin. They're going to fly over your head, but you don't have to let them make a nest in your hair. And uh, I had a lot of that frustration, a lot of stuff flew over my head, but the choice at the end of every day was to not let it build the nest in my hair, mm. not let it take root in my heart. Doesn't mean I didn't have to pull the root again, didn't mean I, have to, I didn't have to weed again the next day, but I chose not to let it thrive. How do we be a friend for somebody who's dealing with that, or a grandson, or uh, whatever, because that's the other piece to this is, one of the worst things we can do is just go into somebody who's in there and yeah. dismiss their pain oh, and dismiss their depression yep. and just say, well, just have faith. Yeah. How do, how do you be a friend? How do you be, how do you actually, how do you, how do you love people the way that God loves people in that moment? Sure. I think in that moment, your ministry to them is not through your mouth. It's just through your presence. Mm. I remember, I remember looking over and feeling so alone. And then there's Mark sitting in the chair next to my bed, not saying anything, just sitting there. And that's that ministry of presence. And honestly, I felt like it was probably going to be okay. Um, and so sometimes you're going to have that. Uh, the thing you do is you just sit there and pray with them. And if they're crying, cry with them. And don't when they try say, to make sense. When they it. say, why say, I don't know. Yeah. Last thing you can do that, Oh, just don't start trying to tell them what God's doing. Yeah. Because you don't know. You may hope, but you don't know. Um, and, you know, in that moment when people are struggling with their belief, it's okay for yeah. them to struggle. It doesn't mean their faith is weak. It means they're processing. Yeah. They're chasing evidence again. I, you know, I, the, the, one, the one prayer in Scripture that I understand is in Mark 9. There's a young dad whose little boy has, has been harassed by this demonic force. And any time the kid is near water, it throws the kid into the water and tries to drown him. Uh, any time it goes near fire, it tries to throw him into the coals to burn him. And apparently had. So if you can imagine having a three- or four-year-old that is terrified of taking a bath and covered in scars, you know, has a lot of PTSD going on for real, that's this kid. And here's this helpless dad. And he has seen Jesus heal somewhere. He has heard about Jesus healing somewhere. He's heard the testimonies of people. And he comes up to Jesus and he says, Lord, here's my son. Here's what happens. Heal him if you can. And I love Jesus' response. Jesus says to him, what do you mean if I can? What Jesus is asking him is, okay, so why in the world are you here? Yeah. What has brought you here? It was evidence that brought him here. And I love that this guy who's in this anguish is honest because he prayed the one verse of Scripture I absolutely understand. And you say, well, he was talking to Jesus. We're right. Anytime you talk to Jesus, that's prayer, right? Well, he's getting to do it face to face. And he says, to, uh, Jesus says anything is possible if someone believes. And this man says to Jesus, I do believe. Help my what? My unbelief, that's the only verse of scripture I am 100% sure I get. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure I've got that one right. What Jesus is saying to him is, your faith is based on evidence. Let's review the evidence. Yeah, is this a Hail Mary or is this a, do you really, why are you here? Is this just a shot in the dark or do you actually believe that God can change this outcome? Right. And the guy both believed and didn't believe at the yeah. same time. He was hesitant. That's a big deal for us when we talk about faith. Can we just say it out loud? It's okay. It's okay. That's an okay place to be in. It's okay. You can't stay there forever. At some point, you got to work through it, but that's okay. Remember the whole story of Job, what happened to him? 
and how God took care of him in the end. He said, test Job and see what happens because that guy will be faithful to me. There are whole chapters, multiple chapters in a row where Job is raging at God. And then he comes back and he goes, but I know it'll be okay, I hope. <laughs> I hope it's going to be okay. And it was. And what does God say about him? God. You're the only one in the midst of that who honored me. Yep, you're the only one in the midst of all this stuff that was going on, all these people giving you advice. You're the only one who actually trusted me. Everybody else was telling him what God was doing. Yep. And Job just said, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know I what's don't going know. on. I don't know what's happening. Hmm. So if you're in that moment of doubt, that's normal. It's okay. Stay with the evidence. Be reminded of the evidence. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for loving us. And Father, we thank you for the evidence we have through your word, but also through the lives of the people that have gone before us. Father, when it comes to faith, help us not to buy into the generic term as if it matters. But help us stay with the term the way, well, your writer intended to, to set it up so we'd have it forever in Scripture. That it's based on an evidence. It's based on what you've done in the past. Because of what you've done in the past, we can trust you into the future even when we don't know what's going on. Father, thank you for loving us. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to share in the Lord's Supper today. And you don't have to be a member to adventure. You don't have to have taken a class here. Uh, if you've given your life to Christ, he invites you to share in this time. The little cups are on the table there in front of you in the basket. And uh, you can peel back that top layer to have access to the bread. There's a thicker tab you can peel back to get access to the juice. And Jesus said of that the night that he established this ritual for us. He said, whenever you do this going into the future, I want you to be reminded of what happens to me tonight. I want you to be reminded of what happens, the evidence that's about to come your way. So that bread will forever remind you of my body, which was broken for you. That juice will forever remind you of my blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sin. It's all there. It's all for remembrance. And in remembering, you can go back and think about what I have already done for you and trust that into the future. Thank the Lord for that today as you pray. Talk to him about whatever you need to, and we'll be back in a few minutes, and we'll close out together. I'm climbing a tower. It's a very tall tower, which makes it a scary and difficult thing to do. It's an analogy. It's like how sometimes God wants us to do something that's difficult and scary, but other times he wants us to do something easy. Like, did you know most of the people helping the kids in Adventureland only have to work one service twice a month? That's not difficult. So here's another analogy uh, for something that's not difficult. I'm not going to climb this tower. I'm going to go back down uh, right now. <laughs> All right. Hey, glad you guys are here with us. Um, man, let me just say, be a, um, uh, how do I put it this way? Make something happen this week. Uh, whether it's somebody's life, uh, whether it's volunteering here at Adventure or somewhere else, 
um, whatever. Man, serve God with everything you got this week and make it, make it change your speech, make it change your attitude, um, let it dictate literally how you treat people and the direction of your life. And that's what discipleship's about. That's what it means to follow Jesus. I hope uh, as we, we sort through some of these things, that are the, they're basic, but they're foundational. I hope you guys are finding this to, to be helpful in the midst of it. Uh, again, we love you guys. We're glad that you're here. Uh, spiritual gifts class, again, sign-ups are back in the back. Uh, we'd love for you to, to come out for that. Uh, it's coming up in a couple of weeks. That's after second service on Sunday, so real easy to, to slide into there. Um, other than that, I don't think there's anything else. So love you guys. God bless you. Have a great week. Please clean up after yourselves, and we will see you later.